Matthew 8, 18 to 22. Now, when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples came to him, said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. Mateo 8, 19 al 22. Cuando Jesús vio la multitud que lo rodeaba, dio orden de pasar al otro lado del lago. Se le acercó un maestro de la ley y le dijo, Maestro, te seguiré a donde quiera que vayas. Las zorras tienen madrigueras y las aves tienen nido, le respondió Jesús. Pero el hijo del hombre no tiene dónde recostar su cabeza. Otro discípulo le pidió, Señor, primero déjame ir a enterrar a mi padre. Sígueme, le replicó Jesús, y deja que los muertos entierren a sus muertos. La palabra de Dios. Good morning, everyone. Again, as I said this morning, uh, it's kind of a week later. They did the Green River last week, but uh, we are celebrating St. Patrick's Day after this service, um, and we'll learn a little bit more about Patrick, um, one of the great heroes of the faith, who was a missionary to Ireland. And as we start this service, I want to tell you about another one of my heroes another missionary, America's first international missionary, and actually the first American Baptist missionary. His name was Adoniram Judson. He was uh, the son, actually, of a pastor, but he didn't become a Christian until a little later in life. He graduated from the top of his class at Brown University. I believe it was Brown. Don't fact check me on that, but uh, anyway, a pretty prestigious school at the time. He was brilliant, uh, the top of his class, highly competitive, um, and had a really bright future ahead of him. Uh, he almost became a deist, and then he realized that wasn't a good idea, um, and he also realized that God would judge the world, and so he uh, decided to attend a seminary, and while he was in seminary, he became a Christian. Like He, he became convinced of the, the Christian faith while he was in seminary, and uh, his family really loved him, and you know he was there their shining star. I think he had a sister, but, you know, he was their son. They, they sent him to college and hoped he would be so successful in life. They actually lined up. His, his dad did a, a really good job as a assistant pastor at, like, one of the preeminent congregationalist churches in Boston at the time. So he was going to be in New England, where he was from, close to home, great, steady, stable job as a pastor. But when Adoniram was in college, he felt Jesus convicting him that other people outside of the United States needed to know the gospel. And so, in spite of the fact that his family wanted him close, and in spite of the fact that he had stability and potentially wealth and all of these things facing him, here in the United States, in the early 1800s, he decided that he was going to follow Jesus' call and go across the world. And it, you've probably heard this, but in, in the 18th century, it was pretty common for missionaries to be sent out and to go to the mission field, and they would pack all of their belongings in coffins. And that's because, seriously, a lot of them died from disease or something else, often before they even got to the field where they were planning on going. Um, and if not, everyone kind of knew that going off and becoming a missionary was something like a death sentence, regardless. The amount of sacrifice that had to go in to that sort of a life, leaving everything and going to a place that was much more impoverished, there was much more disease, there was really no financial benefit at all for being a missionary, even less so then than now. And during that time, uh, when he was getting ready to go to the mission field, Ed and Iram had met this beautiful lady named Anne. Her parents were Christians as well, and he wanted to marry her. They, they, they fell in love, and they both wanted to serve the Lord together. And during his, his uh, time in preparation to go to the mission field, and when he was going to ask this woman to marry him, he first sent a letter to her father. And this is a, a little excerpt from the letter that he writes to her father. He says, 
I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure to a heathen land and her subjection to the hardships and suffering of a missionary life. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you? For the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion, and for the glory of God. It's a pretty powerful letter that Adoniram had to ask. And the decisions that the father would have had to make to allow his daughter at that time to marry this man who was going to drag her off and she was going to live a pretty horrible life and actually die on the mission field. Um, But she was, it was a joyful life serving God with difficulty. And and the reason I bring all of this up at the beginning, and it's pretty like maybe a downer or maybe it's it's powerful, I hope it it is in some way, is because the, the, the point of this passage, if you've read it, and even if you think about it, and as you stumble through it, you think this is a crazy, kind of a crazy passage. And that's Matthew's point in writing this gospel, and that's Jesus' point in these very abrupt sayings that he gives. Because what what this passage wants us to know is that the Son of Man actually demands devoted discipleship that prioritizes Jesus over life's luxuries and loyalties. So I'll say that again. The Son of Man demands discipleship prioritized over all of life's luxuries and loyalties. So I'm going to read verse 18 first, and we'll see this this demand for devoted discipleship. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. When Jesus was doing his ministry, if you remember just before this, he had finished at the end of chapter 7 his, his first recorded sermon in Matthew's gospel, the Sermon on the Mount, where he laid out essentially his law. <laughs> and at the end of that, we saw that Jesus shocked people with how authoritative he spoke and the fact that he had so much authority. And then Ariel preached last week through the first part of Matthew's gospel, or or, sorry, the first part of chapter eight here in Matthew's gospel. And in that, we saw Jesus' power, like his authority to heal. He cleansed a leper, a centurion, a woman who was sick with a fever, and then cast out demons and did a lot of other things. And people were just amazed at all of this. And because of this, crowds were gathering, not only because he was a shocking and amazing teacher, but because he had this amazing power to heal. So people were coming who wanted to be healed and everybody else just wanted to see what this show was and what was going on. And so this is a normal problem for Jesus. He has too many people around and he's, he, he often in Matthew's gospel and the rest of the gospels is trying to figure out a way to get away from the crowds that are just gathering and, and like flooding him. And to do that this time, he says, to some nondescript group of people. We don't know yet. In Matthew's gospel, he hasn't called specifically the 12 yet, but to some smaller group of people that are maybe the slightly more devoted disciples than like the large crowds that are listening, Jesus says, hey, let's go to the other side. And if you look down at verse uh, 23, what, what that clearly means is that he wants them to all head over to the Sea of Galilee to get into a boat and head across to the other side. So the Sea of Galilee at that time was, um, well, I mean, it still is, um, a big body of water. They called it a sea. It's really just a lake, but it's, it's about seven miles by 12 miles. So trying to escape a mob crowd that's gathering around him, he gets in a boat and figures if he cuts it off and heads over, only so many people are going to be able to follow him on boats, and then everyone else is going to have to make this huge journey around this huge lake to get to him. So it's a good way to shed some followers. But what it also represents here is that Jesus is actually calling a smaller group of people, of the people who who have come to listen to him and maybe have been more of the the steady crew that has followed him around. He's asking that decisive group of people to commit a little bit more. So instead of like going home that night or going off and grabbing some food or doing something else, they're going to actually have to get in a boat and go somewhere. So this is sort of a a request or not a request, but a a command. Like Jesus is shouting orders like, hey, everybody, you around here, come with me. We're going to go get in a boat and we're going to run away. So these people have decisions to make. Suddenly, it's more than just a a giant church service with a, a big mob crowd to see the show. These people are making some level of commitment 
to get in a boat with Jesus and go somewhere they weren't planning on going. And so I think as, as we read the rest of this interaction, we need to know that Jesus is speaking to this one specific group of people and he knows the hearts of the people he's talking to because he's God and he knows all things. And so when we interpret this passage, keep that in mind. He's speaking in the midst of a large crowd to a smaller crowd about a thing that they're getting ready to do. But in addition to that, I think we can take these basic principles that when you become a follower of Jesus, or if you want to become a follower of Jesus, there's, there's more than just showing up to a church service, or more than just being a part of a crowd at a religious event involved with being a real Christian. A follower of Jesus follows Jesus. He demands some sort of devoted discipleship. It won't look the same for everybody, but it looks like a lot more than, than just showing up and watching and being a spectator. And he's demanding from these people some time and travel and uncertainty. And he demands that from all of his followers. Are you going to follow Jesus? Will your following of Jesus be wholehearted? If he tells you to do something, will you listen? Or are you kind of just around for the show? It's the first question. Now, as we get into this, we're going to see that Jesus demands devoted discipleships who are going to prioritize him over life's luxuries. So I'm going to read verses 19 through 20. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Or an, another reading could be, but where's the Son of Man going to lay his head? If we think of this situation again that Jesus is in with a large crowd of people around him, he is specifically called out, given commands to some subgroup of that larger group and said, get in boats, we're going to go, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. And what seems to have happened here is that this person, this scribe, probably, again, you kind of have to try to think through what's going on, but is likely not in the group that Jesus told to get in the boats. It almost seems like he's really eager and is running up and saying, hey, hey, let, let, include me, I'll follow you wherever you want to go. Like, I'll, I'll, I'm in it, let me in the, let me on the team. This person is asking, shouting, claiming allegiance to Jesus. And, and, and the other thing that you notice here is that this guy is listed as a scribe, which is interesting because this is one of the few scribes that seems like he really wants to be involved with Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, and all of these different groups of people who are kind of the religious elites at the time were pretty skeptical of Jesus. But this scribe, known as a scribe because he probably devoted some time in like an official scribal school, like he went on to grad school and he studied the Bible and now he, he sees Jesus and he realizes he's a powerful teacher. He's attracting a crowd. He has authority. He has ins insights that seem better than any of the insights that he, he heard in seminary. So now he wants to join Jesus. And as a scribe, he probably thinks, you know, back then the, the scribes were all kind of like the rock star, celebrity, politician, leaders of the people. So being a part of Jesus's crew, if Jesus is attracting this big of a crowd, even if he, he's like the Messiah in some sort of a, a, just a worldly sense, is probably going to be a, a, a good career move. I'll follow you wherever you go. He's very eager to join. But it seems like he's got in his head this idea of Jesus just being another teacher. He uses the word teacher. Everyone else in the Gospels, in Matthew's Gospel in particular, when they understand who Jesus is and the level of authority and, and the power or maybe even the divinity that he has, they call him Lord. Normally, it's just the people that are on the outsides who call Jesus teacher. And so this person is referring still to Jesus as a teacher, but seems sincere, but maybe has some expectations about what following Jesus is, is going to be like that, that aren't quite reality. They're not in line with reality. He's over-eager. He's expecting some sort of a comfortable life. He's going to follow Jesus. He's probably become, going to become wealthy and powerful as well. He's going to have like a nine-to-five job. He'll be able to go home every single night back to his own bed and his own pillow by following Jesus. And so what, Je what does Jesus say? He, he sees this man's heart. He replies, and he says, this famous, pithy, short, 
response directly to this man. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but where am I going to sleep? Jesus doesn't know. Following Jesus, Jesus is an itinerant preacher. So a couple things I should say here um, as, as we get into this, because I've, I've heard this passage abused many times. Jesus isn't really making any specific claims about like government policy on homelessness or housing authority or anything like that. We, we should be very clear about that. This isn't like some sort of a, an, an, a, like a, a command about how to like interact with the sort of homeless people that we know nowadays who live on streets or something like that. Um, it just doesn't really speak to that. And I, I'm not going to give an opinion on that, but I, that's not what this is about. Jesus isn't saying he's a homeless guy who's, who sleeps under a bridge. What Jesus is saying is, I'm an itinerant preacher. I travel around. I'm going to rely on a lot of different people. I don't know where I'm going to be tomorrow night, or, well, he probably does, but, but it's not the same place. It's not the same home. It's not a prosperous life. It's not a luxurious life. Jesus also, again, it, it, this isn't saying that Jesus is homeless in the way that we think. He very much likely had a house in Nazareth where he grew up, and then when he moved and had a station in Capernaum, he either had a bed or a house or rented something from someone or, or stayed someone, somewhere regularly. So it wasn't that he was literally street, like sleeping out on, on the side of the road. What he's saying is, I am a traveling preacher man. My life isn't luxurious. I don't have... Hilton's to stay in everywhere I go. I, it, he's homeless in the same way that a traveling salesman nowadays or a traveling missionary or something like that would be homeless. So Jesus' point isn't really saying anything about homelessness. His point is following Jesus is going to demand something of you and it's going to demand that you sacrifice the stability and the luxury of normal life. For this guy, specifically, he was getting ready to go to the other side. There wasn't a big hotel. There wasn't some group of wealthy people necessarily with their arms open saying, come stay with us. So he says this response to this specific man because Jesus knows this guy's heart. And Jesus knows what he's expecting. And he says, my travel is going to be very uncertain. My locations change. And in the end, his followers, the real followers, are going to experience quite a bit of persecution. Things could get hard, and Jesus is going to die on a cross. So, if you think you're going to follow Jesus for the sake of luxury and stability, th that's not what this game is about. That's not the career path that's ahead of you. And the principle here that we can all take from this is that following Jesus isn't easy. So if you want in because you think it's just a, a good career move, or gonna, gonna help you be a prosperous American, it's, it's probably not. It might actually run contrary to that often. Jesus demands devoted disciples who prioritize him over life's, life's luxuries. You're not gonna get the comfort and stability of a normal middle to upper class life by following Jesus. Oftentimes, he will call you to prioritize the kingdom of heaven over storing up treasures on earth now. You might have to store up treasures in heaven and not here. And we're told in the Bible that this world is not our home. If we're believers, we don't treat this world as our home. That's Jesus' point. Store up your treasures in heaven. You're living for the next life, not necessarily this one, which means you make sacrifices in this one as long-term investments in that one. In the Bible, we're often told, like in 1 Peter, remember when we were in 1 Peter? Peter referred to the church scattered throughout Turkey as sojourners and exiles, people who didn't really belong where they lived. And then in Hebrews, we're told in, in, in chapter 11, verses 13 um, and 16, that people of faith have acknowledged that they are stranger, strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak like this, who act like they don't live here, who understand that they are actually don't belong here, they're seeking another homeland. They are, um, if they'd been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. This man could go back. He can follow Jesus or he can go back to the scribal, fancy life that he wants. And Jesus' point is this. If you want to follow me, you desire a better country that is a heavenly one. And if you do that, God is not ashamed to be called your God, for he has prepared a city. He's prepared a pillow. He has prepared a place 
for you. So that's the first one. Jesus demands devoted discipleship, prioritized over luxuries. Now the next one, 21 through 22. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. That one's all pretty harsh too, if you really take it on the surface of it. Jesus, uh, I guess one commentator dis- described Jesus as provocative and using shock tactics in his communication. He does it a lot. We saw that in the Sermon on the Mount, some pretty extreme things. But, but let me back up a little bit. This disciple, this one, it seems like he's, he's identified as a disciple. And so it seems like the scribe was in some ways listed as a disciple as well, and now it says another disciple, a second person, someone else who is in some way identified with Jesus, who's been along following him, maybe more of a core group in the crowd. He's following Jesus as well. Jesus probably knew him. Everyone else knew him. They'd seen his face around. He's around quite a bit. But he hasn't quite taken that next step of commitment, and Jesus is calling him to that and telling him to get in a boat and come with him. And this guy, this other disciple, who's, if you think about it, again, what's going on in this situation, this man is likely in the group of people that Jesus commanded to get on the boats. And so this guy responds, and he says, Lord, let me first go bury my father. Reasonable request, it seems like, right? Like, what kind of a horrible person would say, no, drop the shovel? But there's, there's debate on this, right? There's always debate about the Bible, And there's probably one of three things that this man is actually asking. We don't really know. He's been following Jesus. He's been around. He's obviously with Jesus right here today. He's been listening to his preaching, and now Jesus is saying, get on the boat and let's go. So the first option is this guy's dad could literally have just died. Maybe he just got word that it happened, potentially, right? Um, Or maybe his father's dead, and they got to plan the burial, and they've got to plan the funeral, that, that, could be the, that could be it, and I mean, there's, there's not really any like, good way to tell by the language here you know, which, which of these ways is what's going on. So it could be that one. This guy's really just asking for a, couple, a, a deferment of his calling for like a few days because he needs to literally get the shovel, get the guy in the ground, or you know, get, the, get the cave ready so they can put him in there. Um, that, that could be what he's asking. And if so, Jesus' response is, is quite, quite extreme. Um, it, it's, it's unlikely that that's what this man is asking, again, unless he literally just got word from someone else that his father just passed away and now he needs to go and, and, and bury him. Uh, if his father had really died and they were in the midst of planning a funeral, he probably wouldn't be out listening to Jesus, interacting with Jesus, following Jesus around, watching the miracles and stuff. So, again, that's one option. Could be true. Probably unlikely. Second option is that maybe this guy's asking for to, to defer or to delay his calling by a few months or so. Uh, there's, there's a chance that what happened and what's going on here is that this man's father has passed away and they've done kind of the initial burial in which they kind of let the remains decay and then they need to do some sort of a reburial ceremony in a little while. His father's already dead. He's already in the ground somewhere and they're going to relocate his remains and, and, and that would require some sort of a family commitment. Like, that's, that's a, a real legitimate family obligation that this man thinks that he wants to be a part of. And if so, like, he's, he's prioritizing that obligation over getting in the boat and obeying Jesus' direct command to get in the boat. So that could be option number two. Or option number three, this, this man could be asking for an indefinite delay of any sort of ministry obligations with Jesus. His father could be alive and well or alive and sickly or getting older and he could be saying, Jesus, I want to honor my father. I want to stay here. I want to serve him. I want to be able to get my inheritance when when, when he passes away. So I want to to be committed to my family here and I'm not going to go with you and get on the boat. So let me wait. Could be months. Could be years. Who knows? His father's still alive. He needs to wait till he dies so we can bury him, respect him, and then get all the benefits that come with being a part of the family all the way up until that point. 
That's it, option three. One, two, or three, we don't really know. But he's asking, he's, yeah, he's obviously clearly asking Jesus to defer his command because he has some sort of a personal, familial conflict or an obligation that his family might not want him to be involved with and that he maybe doesn't want to, uh, his family might not want him to, to skip out on and Jesus is asking him to. We don't know the situation. We do know that the Bible commands us to honor our parents. Jesus actually um, kind of railed against the Pharisees and the Sadducees for giving people excuses to not support their elderly parents by giving their money to church instead. And he said, that's, that's wicked. You're, you're, you're perverting God's law. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 15, verse four, Jesus says, for God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother should surely die. And then we're told later on in, in 1 Timothy, there's this debate on who and how the church should be taking care of widows and, and whether or not it should fall on the church and which ones should be in and out of, of kind of a church welfare program. And Paul specifically says, if that widow has family, the family should take care of them. It shouldn't fall on the church. Don't burden the church. And he says it here. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the, memories, uh, the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So if a family member wants to dump off their elderly parents, their, their aging widow mom, onto the church and have them take care of her, Paul says that's, that's, that's awful. I mean, you might as well be an unbeliever at that point if you're not willing to take care of your parents. And so the Bible wants us to have good relationships with our family when possible. The Bible, Jesus, wants us to honor our father and mother but if there are family obligations that directly conflict with you doing what Jesus tells you to do, Jesus says, I've come to divide families over that kind of thing. If you love your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, or really anybody else more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, Jesus says, whoever loves his father or his mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And then in chapter 12 of Matthew, Jesus specifically says when his mother and his brothers come to, to, to see him and everyone says, hey, your mom's outside. Jesus probably wasn't disrespecting his mom and I'm sure he went and talked to her afterwards, but he says, he uses this as a teaching moment and he says, hey, whoever does the will of my father in heaven, this is my brother, my sister, and my mother. So the church and serving God creates a family that also is at least on par with, if not above, commitment to our biological families. But with that said, with the church, or with the body and the family being important elements of our lives that we should not disrespect, we shouldn't cut off, we shouldn't, we shouldn't, <laughs> shouldn't intentionally have bad relationships with our family members, Jesus is saying, if, if they're conflicting with your call to follow me, then your loyalties need to be rearranged. Jesus is saying here that he's demanding devoted discipleship that's prioritized over all human loyalties. And again, he uses this sort of shock tactic, let the dead bury their own dead. It's witty, it's kind of striking. I don't know if you'll ever forget that one. But what is he saying? I mean, obviously he's not saying that like a dead person should get out of their grave and get a shovel and throw the other person and then get back in and rebury themselves. Um, so he, he's most likely um, referring to some sort of a spiritual death here. He's saying, for, for your family members who are not interested in spiritual things, for your family members whom I have not called, they can worry about that. Prioritizing that sort of thing, prioritizing family over following Jesus, that's for people who are spiritually dead. People who are spiritually alive, people who have been born again, who have life in Jesus, they prioritize Jesus. That's just how it works. Just like Adoniram Judson, I'm sure he would have loved to stay and be wealthy. I'm sure he would have loved to stay and be able to go to the, the family cookouts all the time and uh, see his family on the holidays every year. But Jesus is saying here, let the dead bury their own dead. Let them worry about that. Follow me. You follow me. And in the end, the, the, the father's gonna get buried. They're not just gonna let the, 
the body lay out dead and rotten decay. Someone will bury him. Follow me. I'm calling you. So the principle again here is that Jesus demands loyalty to him over all other human loyalties. And yet there's, there's a second one here. I don't know if you noticed. He also demands your devotion now. So this guy used his human loyalties, his family, to, to say, I'll, I'll do that someday. But the reality is, is that we don't really ever know if there's a someday to come in which we can respond to Jesus' demand for discipleship appropriately. You might not have a tomorrow. You might not have a next week. If you haven't prioritized Jesus yet, what are you waiting for? Time is running out, and the, the gospel call is urgent. Not only because there are people who also need the gospel, people are dying, the world is in desperate need of Christ's followers to take Christ to the world, but you're also dying too. Who knows when you're going to have another chance? Why wait to respond to Jesus? Why wait to follow him? You, you don't know if you're going to have another chance. So my question here is, are there things in your life, are there loyalties or luxuries that you are allowing to delay your commitment to Jesus? Or, as a Christ follower, do, do you see that conflict? Are there things where you have to rethink priorities? You have to be different than the people around you. You have to obey Jesus, and then sometimes obeying Jesus creates strains within the relationships that, that otherwise wouldn't be there. Have you ever gone, had to move, or go do something, avoid something, skip out on an event for the sake of Jesus? That's what Jesus is calling us to. If he's calling you, if he's asking you, if he's demanding you, if he's convicting you, if you have something in your life that Jesus is calling you to, whether it's salvation or whether it's further service, time is running out, you might not get another chance. Don't miss the boat, literally and figuratively. This guy didn't want to miss the boat. You might not have another chance. So again, we've got this demand from Jesus. He's demanding devoted discipleship that prioritizes obedience to him and commitment to him, devotion to him wholeheartedly that, that triumphs over any sort of conflicting desire for luxuries in this life or desires for other loyalties in this life. But you might be saying, like, who is this guy? And, and, and I'll start out by saying, if, if, if I or some other religious leader comes up to you and says, God's will for you is this, follow me, drop everything in your life and do it. Do what I say. Run away from those people. Like, don't, if someone wants to control your life to that level, like, that's a cult leader. So, so most people don't have the ability to look into your heart and say, I think you need to do this exact thing in this situation. You need to follow me. You need to sell everything you have. You need to get here and join my church or give all of your money to my ministry or something like that. There are crazy lunatics who do that in their ministries, and if you run across that, run away. So what's different about Jesus? Like, how does he have, like, where does he get off telling these people, let the dead bury their own dead? You'll have nowhere to, to lay your head. Well, I don't know if you noticed, but in, in verse 20, I'm going to go back and reread that. There's something interesting that happened here. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If, if, if you're not aware, this is actually the first time that Jesus uses the phrase son of man in Matthew's gospel. This is the first time it's popped up. It's kind of a weird, a weird thing. Like, why is he calling himself the son of man? Like, he's, he's obviously referring to himself. Um, and then he starts doing it a lot. This is, this is Jesus' favorite way of referring to himself. He does this all the time in the gospels. In fact, he does it like, there, there's over 80 instances of the phrase son of man being used in the gospels, and then it, in, a little bit in Acts, and it pretty much drops off after that. The early church didn't call him the son of man, um, the early, uh, in, in the New Testament, and then after that, the early church wasn't really sure what to do with it. Um, so they didn't really, it wasn't a common term that anyone else ever used for Jesus other than Jesus himself. So why does he do that? Why is he calling himself the Son of Man? He, he, he uses it like over 80 times. All but one of them is, is either Jesus referring to it in himself as it in the narratives or someone saying this is what Jesus said. So it always comes out of Jesus' mouth. He's always the source of it, other than one time, which is in the book of Acts, when Stephen's about ready to die, and he says that he sees the Son of Man. So, so what does this mean? 
And what is it about this title that gives Jesus the ability to command people to prioritize him and demand devoted discipleship above luxuries and loyalty? Well, I think Jesus used it for a few reasons. One, it's, it's kind of an ambiguous term. It's kind of cryptic. So he can use it regularly. And, and there were a few debated, there, even today there are debates as to like what exactly it means. Um, especially if you deny Jesus' divinity, uh, you tend to think that this just means he's saying he's a human, which nobody else did at the time, so it's kind of a really weird argument. But he, he's definitely using it because it is vague. It's, it's cryptic. And yet, he uses it a lot. And I think by the time he ends his life, when he is on trial, you can see very clearly why he used this word, this phrase. In Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is being asked, are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? When when he's on trial and the religious leaders want to know what kind of claim he's really making, Jesus says, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then what was the response here? He says, then, then in response to that, the highest priest ripped his robes. He was terrified, angry, lost it. And he says, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You've heard his blasphemy himself. So this phrase, Son of Man, means a lot. And it means something very specific. And it means something to Jesus. And he brought it, he grabbed it, and he applied it to himself out of the book of Daniel. So in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, there's this vision that Daniel has of all, it's this apocalyptic vision of all of these crazy monsters coming out of the ocean. And, and each one of them represents human governments in rebellion against God and the way that they interact in the world. And then finally, the worst, scariest, biggest monster beast thing comes out representing this big, scary, monster, human government thing in rebellion against God that's going to persecute the people of God. And then towards the end of that vision, all of a sudden, like out of nowhere, God appears on the scene. And a courtroom is set up, and God is going to judge the nations of the world. The scene is set, God is ready to judge the world, And then, in Daniel's vision, right when God's there judging all of these powerful nations who are oppressing God's people, Daniel says, starting in verse 13, And I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all nations and peoples and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. This is the source of Jesus' self-designation as the Son of Man. This one who comes from God, looks like God, is acting like God, ruling all of the nations of the world, and yet he's in the form of a man, So this title, Son of Man, really is signifying much more about Jesus being God or about the Son of Man being God than it is about the Son of Man being human. In fact, it's a God figure who's going to judge and rule over all of the world, but who's going to look like a person. And Jesus says, that's me. In this passage, Jesus is saying, the reason that I have the authority to tell you to let your dead father bury himself The reason that I have the authority to tell you that life is going to be hard if you follow me is because I am the Son of Man. I am the God who created the universe, the God who upholds the universe by the power of my will, the God who will one day judge the universe and who will rule over the universe. I have authority to do that, to call you to devoted discipleship that that trumps any other sort of luxury or any other loyalty you have in your life. And not only did he do this and come to do all of these things, but he actually came and he saves a people for himself. As the Son of Man, he dies to secure the salvation of those who will follow him, and then he raises from the dead to show that he is who he said he was and that there is hope for everybody who puts their faith in him. So although he's commanding and demanding some pretty harsh things, don't worry, there's, there's payback. There's a reward. There's something ahead 
For you, if you decide today that you are going to prioritize Jesus over luxuries and loyalties. In fact, in, in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus says to his disciples, so, that, so there's this, this story where this rich man comes to Jesus and wants to enter the kingdom, and Jesus tells him, sell all of your possessions, you specific rich man, and then come follow me. And then he starts talking, and the people are like, well, if, the, if a rich man can't become a follower of Jesus, well, who can become a follower of Jesus? Aren't the rich people able to do whatever they want to do? And Jesus says, well, you know, what's impossible for people it's possible for God. And then, after that, the disciples, Peter specifically, speaking for the disciples, he says, well, Jesus, what about us? What are we gonna get? We quit, we left everything. We're the devoted followers. We got in the boat, remember? We got on the boat and we followed you across. What do we get? And Jesus tells Peter this. He says, truly, I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit in his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive 100-fold and will inherit eternal life. So where does Jesus get off telling each one of you that if you want to follow him, you need to prioritize him and everything he demands of you over any other luxuries or loyalties that you want? Where does he get off? Well, he gets off because he is the most powerful entity in the universe. He's going to come to judge the world and he will reward you for obeying him. So when you have to sacrifice in this life, there is a reward. And the one who will reward you is the one who is most worthy of taking that, that sacrifice and receiving it from you because he died for you and he rose again so that you could be saved. So, we don't really know how these two men responded. Matthew's kind of vague. Uh, he, I mean, he's literally silent on it. Some people debate if they, they followed or not. Or not. Um, since we're not told they did, and um, in a few weeks or a couple weeks, we'll see that Matthew himself was actually responsive. We're thinking that they probably didn't respond appropriately, but we don't know. It's, it's, it's quiet on that subject. But I think it's, it's interesting because it ends quietly almost with a hanging question in the air. Jesus demands devoted discipleship that prioritizes him as the son of man over life's luxuries and loyalties. So how are you going to respond? How will you respond? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this son of man. We thank you for the glory that his kingdom brought into the world and that we can look forward to if we follow Jesus. Lord, if there are people here who are on the fence, who are deciding whether or not to get in the boat, I pray that you would save them. Lord, and for all of us, Lord, who are daily battling temptation to prioritize other loyalties and other luxuries over Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would convict us, that you would guide us. Lord, I pray that we would sense Jesus' calling on us individually clearly. I pray that we would serve him faithfully. I pray for this church that we would prioritize Jesus over everything. And I pray that you would be glorified by us all. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing our closing song.